This last Christmas, uh, one of the gifts that we got our boys was one of those real big trampolines. And it's really fun to watch them jump on it, and if I'm honest, it's fun to watch them fall on it. But the, uh, <laughs> we, we, we found this trampoline through Facebook, and so we bought it secondhand at a much discounted rate for what they are new. And so I went to pick it up, and it was in good shape, and the guy had it disassembled and put it in my vehicle and brought it home. And then about a month later or so, uh, I started assembling the trampoline. And one of the great things about buying things secondhand, buying them used, is they usually don't come with instruction manuals. I've never put together one of those big trampolines before. And, and it's one of those things, it's hard to conceptualize how everything works and whatnot. And so I was putting the frame together, and I noticed there weren't many bolts or screws to hold it together. I mean, it kind of, the, the bars would slip into place and everything, uh, but then they, if they would fall down. See, what, one of the concepts with that, those trampolines is they are, the frame is held together by the tension of the mat and the springs. And so they don't need a lot of bolts, because if the springs break, the whole thing's broken anyway, so there's no reason for the frame to, to work properly. But, but it took me quite a while to actually construct the trampoline just because of I didn't know how to do it. I didn't have instructions. I was just kind of flying by the seat of my pants. And, and I, I think that's how we feel about life sometimes. We feel as though we don't know what to do. We don't know how to do it. How, how do we go about this? Because life doesn't come with an instruction manual. And every once in a while, we'll talk about, you know, the Bible is our instruction manual. And I agree with that, but it doesn't give step-by-step -step instructions of how to handle this situation. You know, it talks about trusting God, about, about how, how we live our life in the broad scheme of things. But what's the next step? How do we do it this way? We want detailed explanations for how things work. Because if we're honest with ourselves, we're broken. We have hardships. We have difficulties. There are things in our life, maybe not right now, but you've experienced difficulties that you've had to rebuild or reassemble or reconstruct your life on some level. And it's hard. It's difficult. Let's make sure we don't gloss over that. It's not easy to rebuild. But God calls his people to do that. He calls us to rebuild. He calls us to restore. And that's what we find happening in the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah. He is calling his people back to rebuild, to restore, and get back to where God wants his people to be. Now, now the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah, one of the things we have to recognize is the people are in exile. Assyria has come and destroyed part of Israel. And then, then Babylon came and destroyed the rest and deported the people. And they were living in exile. But when they were living in exile, God gave them instructions. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 25, 11 and 12, we find that God says the, this entire land would become a desolate wasteland. Talking about Israel. Israel and her neighboring lands, uh, lands will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. Then after the 70 years of captivity are, are over, I will punish the king of Babylon and his people for their sins, says the Lord. I will make the country of the Babylonians a wasteland forever. Now for context, uh, Babylon is kind of modern day Iraq, Baghdad, that type of area. Just for you to get a mental picture of the prophecy that Jeremiah was giving. But God's people are living in exile. And then we get to the book of Ezra and things begin to change. But while they were in exile, it's very clear, Jeremiah 29, it, God tells them, tells his people, says, build homes, plant gardens, have families, pray for the peace and prosperity of the city in which you live. He says, thrive where you are. They were in exile for 70 years. God said, thrive where you are, but things are getting ready to change. God is getting ready to call his people to something different. And it starts in Ezra chapter 1, where it's, the first year of King Cyrus, the king of Persia. And God is getting ready to fulfill the prophecy that he gave through Jeremiah. See, what God did is he stirred the heart of King Cyrus to make this proclamation his writing. And here's what Cyrus said. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all nations on earth. He has appointed me to build him a temple at Jerusalem. Any of you who are his people... 
may go to Jerusalem in Judah to rebuild this temple of the Lord, who, of, of God, who lives in Israel, which is Jerusalem of Judah. And may your God be with you. Wherever this Jewish remnant is found, let their neighbors contribute to their expenses by giving them silver and gold, livestock and supplies for the journey, as well as a voluntary offering for the, this temple of God in Jerusalem. God's people are in exile, and it starts with God stirring the heart of King Cyrus of Persia. Now, one of the things I think is really interesting in this concept is to consider how this compares to a different biblical story. You know, God's people are in exile. They're in slavery, essentially. Several hundred years earlier, they were in slavery in Egypt, and God worked, he moved, he brought his purposes, and there was the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, act, acted completely different than Cyrus. Remember, Pharaoh's heart was hard, and God sent the ten plagues and essentially destroyed Egypt by force because Pharaoh's heart was hard. But in this instance, we see that Cyrus is able to respond to God's movement. His heart is stirred. But one of the things about God, regardless if we have the situation of Pharaoh's heart being hard, or Cyrus's heart being stirred, God's purposes still came. His plan still came to fruition. Because God is the director, and our world is his stage. And he appoints everything, tells everything where to go. It's not as though we can thwart God's plans. When God has his plan, nothing can stop it. Not, not Pharaoh, king of Egypt, with hard hearts. Not Cyrus, king of Persia. Arguably, at their respective times, the most powerful people in the world, that they could not stop God's plan. And here's the thing that I love about comparing and contrasting those things. It helps me recognize that God doesn't waste anything. He uses everything. He can use Pharaoh, who's as far away from him as he wants, and he can use Cyrus, who is open to what God is telling him to do. Because Cyrus was compelled to build the temple. And on, on some levels... He is showing sympathy to Jerusalem, to God's people. He's saying, I see how you have been treated, and we're going to try to rectify that. But verse 3, when, when, when Cyrus is talking about, may your God be with you, and talking about this temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, like the, the, what, the phrases that he's using makes it clear that Cyrus does not necessarily believe that this God that he is sending people to build a temple to is the actual one true God. He's saying, well, he may be a God. One of the approaches that the Persians had is they worked hard to try to get the favor of all the local deities. So to Cyrus's mind, this God of Jerusalem was just somebody that, you know what, let's build him a temple and maybe he'll help us out later. Now, I'm not trying to, to paint Cyrus in a bad light, but let's make sure we recognize he didn't have this conversion story. It's, this is how they worked from a philosophical standpoint. But he told those people who were the followers of God, followers of Yahweh, he says, you can go. You can return. You can go and build this temple. You can restore that which has been broken. And so in this moment, with this proclamation, Exile is over. Exile is being ended through Cyrus. So it's a choice that the people have. They can stay there or they can return. All because God stirred in the heart of Cyrus. That's where this movement begins. That's where this starts. That's where we see that God doesn't waste anything. He uses everything. But with the same theme as trying to appease the local deities, the Persians were encouraged to contribute to the expenses of God's people returning from exile. You know, silver, gold, supplies for the journey, livestock, and then an offering for the temple. I mean, that's a lot of stuff. It's probably speaking to some of the wealthier individuals in the country of, hey, sacrifice a little bit, and maybe this God will come back and help us later. Again, they're trying to get the local deity on their side. But God's people are getting ready to return to Jerusalem to begin the restoration process, to begin to rebuilding. Now, over the years, I have purchased many different items that required assembly. 
And, and before Roy was born, we purchased a crib. And for whatever reason, we'd heard that cribs were notoriously difficult to assemble. And, and Hannah and I, we work really good together on these types of projects. It's, uh, uh, it's fun. And so we kind of, we, we, we literally timed ourselves of how long is this going to take us. And, and so, so we got all the supplies, we got everything ready. And, and I, I said we timed ourselves. She may have a more accurate recollection than I do on this. I think it was eight minutes. Was it somewhere around there? Tw- oh, tw- uh, let's go with eight. <laughs> Pretending, we'll say it's eight minutes. So, so 12 minutes. But anyway, so from start to finish, it took us 12 minutes. And so we were pretty pumped about that. But we had the instruction manual. We followed the steps. We did everything in order as we were supposed to. But with a lot of projects, you tend to have extra bolts or screws or pieces. What do you do with those things? Right? How, how, how do you... How do you I mean, do you just throw them away and hope you don't need them? I, I mean, we live in a very throwaway society, don't we? And it's, uh, it's hard for me to really fathom the concept of the milk pan, of you'd set your glass jars out on the porch, and then in the morning the milkman would come and replace those empty jars with full jars and take those empty jars back. And, and just the fact of, I don't know where that other milk jar was from. Right? Who else used that milk jar? Was it cleaned appropriately? Right? Those are the questions we ask today. Now, now most of our milk comes in, in plastic cartons or jugs or, or cardboard cartons. And so it, it's, it's really hard for us okay, to reuse that. But there's a big difference between setting out the, the milk jar and getting it reused than going to recycle your unused product, your products that you're done. There's a big difference in reusing and recycling in that regards. We are, as a society, tend to throw things away. We tend to get rid of them and move on to the next thing because it's cheaper. It's cheaper just to throw it away than actually deal with it. But God is stirring in the hearts of the people to go back, to restore, to rebuild with the understanding that God doesn't waste anything. He uses everything. So he's already stirred in the heart of Cyrus. He has had Cyrus issue this proclamation. And now God stirs in the hearts of the priests and the Levites and the leaders of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And as Cyrus instructed, their neighbors assisted by giving them articles of silver and gold, supplies for the journey, and livestock. They also gave them many valuable gifts in addition to voluntary offerings. Now, this group of, of, of Jews, of God's people that are living in exile, a common phrase, a word that you use, they're the remnant. They're, they're just the small group that is left, the small group that God is calling out of exile. But one of the things we'll find through the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah is not everybody returned right here. I mean, God stirred in the hearts, but not everybody returned. There were times later where... where Ezra finally came, and then Nehemiah finally came. In fact, the the people who the books are named after didn't come with the first return. God blessed the people who stayed, and God blessed the people who returned. And so we have to make sure we're careful. If, If we say, well, everybody has to respond this way and this time and this manner, then we're getting back to the instruction manual. We've got to follow all these steps, but that's not how life works. That that's not how God calls us to live. I mean, there are certain standards, certain parameters that we have to, to abide by and live around. But God blessed those who stayed and he blessed those who returned. So one of the things I find about God is that God takes initiative in redemption. God is not passive. He's not sitting up there in heaven twiddling his thumbs saying, man, I should probably do something. But, you know, this, this TV show is really good. Right? That, that's not how God functions. And isn't that great? That God takes initiative. He's active. He pursues us. So the issue is not that we, we, we follow what everybody else is doing or everyone does the exact same thing. But the issue is that our heart is stirred and so we respond with all, our whole heart. That's the issue. We've got to respond wholeheartedly, whatever that is. Whether we stay, whether we return, we have to respond with our whole heart. But one of the things I think is also important for us to remember is that God chooses to work through his people. God, God doesn't need me. 
He doesn't need me to stand right here and preach. But he chose to use people like me to do this. He has chosen you to be his people in this world, to fulfill his purposes. Because without you, we'll miss opportunities. Without you, there are people who won't experience Jesus because God has gifted and equipped you personally to do that. He has said, I'm going to work through you as a person to fulfill my purposes and bring my redemption into this world. And through this, through God's plan, through God using his people, they left. They returned. And the Persians gave them all these things, gave them silver and gold, supplies for the journey, livestock, other valuable gifts in addition to the offerings. But this is kind of also parallels the Egypt story when, when God's people fleed slavery from Egypt. Essentially what was happening is that Egypt was so desolate, so destroyed from the plagues that the Egyptian people just gave them stuff, said, leave, go away, take our stuff, just quit bothering us. But that's not what was happening here. God's people were freed from exile in a way that people were celebrating with them, of, of here is, here's some stuff, here's money, here's food, here's resources, here's gifts, whatever that is. And so we see that God can work both ways. He can work in a way that we have to flee because of all the destruction, but he can work also that even those who don't know him can support the work that he's doing. Now, there may have been Persians who, who had converted and, and became followers of God, but likely there were a lot that weren't. But God can use those people. He can use them to fulfill his purposes. I'm not saying they're saved or not. That's not my point. But God can use anything. He doesn't waste anything. He uses it all. Now, we we built that crib for Roy, right? And and, uh, once Roy outgrew it, we disassembled the crib and, and put it away. Before Rome was born, we needed to get the crib out again. And as you can imagine, when we first built the crib and we were were organizing and cleaning up afterwards, I felt there was no reason to keep the instruction manual. Right? So so we go back to the second time. uh, I'm constructing the crib for for Rome, and um, I don't have the instruction manual. But I had seen it together. I had put it together, and I had taken it apart. So I was able to put it together without much of an issue. It took me significantly longer than it did the first time because you've got to figure out where the pieces are and what goes and what doesn't, and you've got to to put screws in the wrong place a few times, you know, humbling experience as it is. But but I, I was able to assemble it. So it was a little different than the trampoline because I'd put it together, I'd taken it apart, I'd seen it together. So I had a little bit more intimate knowledge of it. And... Like I said, it took, me, it took me significantly longer than the first time when we put it together, but I was still able to construct the crib. But as I threw out the instruction manual, I was thinking about later of, of why do we make choices of what to keep and what not to keep? I mean, sometimes, sometimes I find I just keep some of the randomest stuff, and I look back later like, why did I keep that? That's just so strange or weird, or, or what was I thinking in that moment? Every once in a while, I'll clean out my drawer, my dresser drawers, and I'll be astonished at how many paint shirts I've kept, right? I'm not a professional painter. There's no reason I need to keep 12 shirts that would be classified as paint shirts, right? But we do. We do that type of stuff. I'm sure a lot of you who are laughing are laughing because you're like, I do the same thing. Right? We keep some things we keep, some things we don't. Some things we deem valuable, other things we don't. But God has called his people to rebuild. He's called his people from destruction, from despair, from difficulty. And so he's saying, I don't waste anything. I'm going to use everything. And so I think this next part is really important because it kind of brings everything back to the prophecy that God had given. Because after God stirred in the heart of Cyrus, and he made the proclamation. After he stirred in the hearts of his people, and the Persians were sympathetic, then King Cyrus stepped up, and he brought himself, he brought out the articles of 
that from the temple that King Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem and had placed in his own temple. Cyrus directed his treasurer to count these items and present them to Sheshbazar, the leader of the exiles returning to Judah. At this moment, when all those items were returned, we see how fully and how completely God is undoing everything that Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians did. All the destruction, all of the destitution, everything that Nebuchadnezzar did, God is undoing. He's returning every last item so that the temple can be restored to its glory. God is leaving nothing undone. He, he is making sure that his people are completely and 100% restored. And so we find that Persia now controls Babylon. Babylon was this avenue of destruction that destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, deported and exiled God's people, and now Babylon is destroyed, as God's prophesied in Jeremiah chapter 25. Because Cyrus took everything that reminded the people of Babylon's conquest of Israel. And now it's done. Now it's gone. All those items are returned. And God has restored his people. So the remnant is getting ready to return. They are moving in that direction. They have everything they need. One of the things I find interesting with this is we see how short some of these these powerful nations last. Because Assyria was ruling the world and Babylon came and knocked them off. And Babylon was ruling the world and maybe a few hundred years later, Persia came and knocked them off. Then Persia was ruling the world and a few hundred years later, Alexander the Great came and knocked them off. Then shortly after that, the Romans came and we see how all these worldly powers are being built up and then being knocked down. But God's saying, I'm going to restore my people. And if God can use Pharaoh and Cyrus, we don't have anything to fear in this world. There may be difficulties. There may be situations where we live at a time where life's not easy or convenient. But God is in control. His purposes are coming. He is able to overcome that which looks impossible. Because from God's people's standpoint, they knew what Jeremiah had said. They knew they were living in exile. But they'd say, how is God going to do this? How is God going to restore us? How is he going to fulfill his promises? And you may be asking those same questions. How is God going to restore you? How is he going to heal you? How is he going to fulfill the promises in your life? Now, we want that instruction manual. We want that man said, these are the, these are the 12 steps. However, even if it was 1,200 steps, at least we would know the plan. Right? I mean, that, that's at least how my mind works. But God has made this promise. He's restoring his people. But you know where it begins? It begins with having a heart that's stirred. And what we have to recognize is it begins with my heart, not your heart. I'm confident there are people in your life that you say they need to get their act together. They need to figure it out. They are causing so much frustration and strife in my life. They are not being fair to me. And God says, let me worry about their heart. You worry about your heart. Ezra and Nehemiah is about God's people returning, about them restoring, about them rebuilding, about them coming back and recreating their life. God says, I'm going to do it. But the heart has to be stirred. And you've got to focus on your heart. God took care of Pharaoh. God took care of King Cyrus. And all he does is he says, take care of yourself. Make sure your heart is where it needs to be. See, God doesn't waste anything. He uses everything. There are people in your life that you wish you could change. And I'm not trying to be dismissive towards what other people are doing to you or not doing to you. But I recognize that the starting point is making sure your heart is stirred. Because until your heart is stirred, no matter what God does in their heart, it's not going to make a difference for you. 
We need to make sure we are stirred. So I was thinking about those different things I assembled. You know, some of you may be just starting. And I think you're like the crib that first time. You know, it, if we follow the directions, follow the instructions, we can assemble it real quick and it's going to be great and it's going to be brand new and it's going to be fresh. I think some of you are more like the crib the second time or the trampoline of you've been taken apart. You've been torn down. You've been frustrated. You've allowed things to just pull you away from whatever that is. It's a lot more difficult to rebuild. But I promise you, it's worth it. It's, it's worth going through that effort. It's worth going to Jesus and saying, stir my heart. That may not change the other person, may not change the situation, may not get the miracle you think you want or you think you need, but it's going to change your reality. We aren't necessarily rebuilding a, a physical altar or a physical temple or a physical city like Ezra and Nehemiah did. But I think we're rebuilding the kingdom of God. We're rebuilding the kingdom of heaven because sin has wreaked havoc in our world. And when Jesus came, he inaugurated the kingdom of heaven. We're living in that reality now. And so Jesus says, build my kingdom. So I don't know where you are. I don't know what's on your heart. I don't know what has held you down. But I do know that God isn't wasting you. He doesn't want to waste you. But I also know those people in your life that frustrate you, that bother you, that hurt you, God doesn't want to waste them either. God wants to use you for his purposes. And that's when we find fulfillment. That's when we find healing. That's when we find peace. God doesn't waste anything. He uses everything, even the people we don't like, even the Pharaoh, even Cyrus. God uses everything.